Good evening, uh, everyone. My name is Mark Mamagonian. I'm the Director of Academic Affairs. I don't need to read that part. Uh, at the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, Nasser. Uh, thank you for, for making the time to be with us this evening, uh, online or in person or, or by whatever means you are watching. Uh, tonight's program is on the publication After the Ottomans, Genocide's Long Shadow and Armenian Resistance, uh, published just recently by I.B. Taurus. And the program tonight, of course, features two of the editors of this important volume and one of the contributing authors. We're all aware that uh, the program tonight is occurring in the shadow of the rapidly developing events in Artsakh and Armenia. Uh, in the face of this, all of us are asking ourselves, does anything we are doing really matter? Uh, I can't answer that question for you tonight, uh, it's a difficult question to answer. I can only reiterate something that I said just a few days ago at another uh, NASA program, and that is that we will continue to do our work, and part of that work is insisting on truth, whether truth lies in the pages of history or in the present, and even in the face of denial and overwhelming power that insists on lies, we will continue to do our work. We will not stop. I'm sure none of you will stop either. And I ask you, please, don't stop. There will be other upcoming programs that either directly or indirectly, uh, as, as surely tonight's, does, uh, tonight's event does, speak to the ongoing assault on Artsakh. And I just want to mention briefly two of them that are occurring this coming weekend. On Sunday, October 1st at 2 p.m. Eastern, there will be an online panel discussion, uh, the fall of Artsakh, refugee crisis, existential threat, and uncertain future. Uh, this will be on Zoom and on YouTube. Information is on our website and will be going out by email uh, shortly. Uh, this is co-sponsored by the Nasser Kalust Gulbenkian Foundation Lecture Series on Contemporary Armenian Issues and the Society for Armenian Studies and features an excellent panel uh, of, of, of folks uh, who will be discussing various aspects of what's happening. Uh, also Sunday, October 1st, at 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, uh, Professor Claude Mutafian will be speaking at the Arat Askijan Museum in, in uh, Southern California and also live on Zoom. Uh, he will be giving a two-pronged talk on Jerusalem and the Armenians and also a brief history of of Karabakh. Uh, the history is important to understanding what's happening in the present. There's, this is sort of stating the obvious, but uh, Mutafian is certainly someone who has the expertise to present that history in a way that connects uh, to what's happening right now. Following the formal discussion tonight uh, among our panelists, we will open things up to audience questions. Uh, for those in the audience, here in person, please, I ask you to get up and use the microphone so that everyone can hear you, whether they are online or in the room. For those of you on Zoom, please use the Zoom Q&A to post your questions, and I will try to retrieve them. So tonight's program, indeed, focuses on an important new publication. Uh, after the Ottomans, Genocide's Long Shadow and Armenian Resistance. The book is edited by Hans Lukas Kieser, Sehan Bayraktar, and Khachig Muradyan. We have with us tonight Khachig Muradyan, Sehan Bayraktar, and Nanor Barsumian, who is one of the contributing authors to this volume. There are also excellent articles by other terrific scholars, and I can't recommend the book highly enough. It presents 11 scholars of history, anthropology, literature, and political science exploring the Arme Ottoman Armenians not only as the major victims of the First World War and its post-war treaties, but also as agents striving for survival, writing history, transmitting the memory, and searching for justice. I think it's important to make the point, and I'm sure the speakers tonight will make the point, that the Armenians that are the subject of this book are not merely agents, not merely victims. They are both victims and agents at the same time. And I think that's, that's a key, key uh, aspect of this book. Our speakers tonight, 
Dr. Sayan Bayraktar is the PhD coordinator at the Graduate School of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at the University of Zurich. She has a PhD in social services from the University of Konstanz in Germany. Her research focuses on the politics of memory and apology and political communication. She is the author of an important work in German that I'm not going to pronounce, but which translates as Politics and Memory, the Armenian Genocide in Turkish Discourse Between Nationalism and Europeanization. Dr. Khachi Muradian is a lecturer, lecturer in Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies at Columbia University, and he is the Armenian and Georgian Area Specialist at the Library of Congress. He also serves as co-principal investigator of the project on Armenian Genocide Denial at the Global Institute for Advanced Study at New York University. He's the author of the award-winning book, The Resistance Network, The Armenian Genocide, and Humanitarianism in Ottoman Syria. He's also a member of the Nasser Board of Directors and our Academic Advisory Committee. We thank him for all of those things. And Nanor Barsoumian, who will, who will be the uh, moderator tonight, is the former editor of the Armenian Weekly newspaper and the author of the chapter, Genocide Commemorations in Turkey, a Social Identity Perspective in the volume After the Ottomans. So I will now hand the microphone back to Nanor until later. All right. Um, thank you, Mark. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're gathered to hear from Sehan and Khachig, two brilliant editors and scholars um, who came out with this book, After the Ottomans, Genocide's Long Shadow and Armenian Resilience. And Hans Lukas Kieser, the third editor, could not join us, as Mark mentioned. These past couple of days have been devastating for many following the situation in Artsakh. There's fear, loss, dispossession, and violence. These are topics that both of you have researched extensively, and in fact, this entire volume deals with them. Discussed in this book are ideologies, policies, and realities that continue to shape our world. On the flip side, this book is also a tribute to resistance, resilience, and what you call the micro-histories. These chapters shed new light on the past, and since the past informs the present, they will also help us reconsider and reframe today's realities. So there's a lot of trauma in the Armenian world today, and our sights are set on Artsakh. So before we begin talking about this book, and later we are going to talk about Artsakh more. I want to first give you an opportunity to share what's on your mind. Okay. First of all, thanks for the invitation and um, welcome to this event. Um, thanks for making the, this event uh, possible. Um, um, it's not, of course, um, very difficult to um, to express to express um, my feelings towards um, current um, current um, happenings in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, um, what I am reminded of because of my um, my, my work is that um, it is once again um, a situation where where the Armenian um, Armenians are left alone um, despite. Um, despite uh, the fact that the world is um, looking at the events. So we have a life, life a refugee crisis, so to say, and um, it, it sort of looks like um, that uh, Armenians are alone on um, by themselves. So that's, of course, a very sad situation. Yeah, my, uh, perhaps my first comments would, would have to do with uh, this feeling of loss and grief that uh, over the past several days has uh, impacted Armenian communities around the world. And of course, starting with the very population of Artsakh, nagorno karabakh uh, who are being uh, forced out of their uh, homes and ancestral lands uh, as we speak in the thousands, in the tens of thousands, in what can only be uh, described as ethnic cleansing. 
And in that kind of uh, environment, it would be, I would be, uh, it would be critical to acknowledge first uh, the, the, the tremendous sense of loss and grief that I have been encountering in the Armenian community, uh, both on social media, as well as in person. Uh, we, we had another event yesterday, and again, it was palpable there. In that, in that vein, in that context, as, as a community, uh, across, as communities across the world, we're trying to address this major humanitarian uh, challenge and uh, try to rise to, the, to this challenge and to this uh, environment, to this occasion. Uh, perhaps the one thing that I would like to emphasize more than anything else is the importance of uh, solidarity and the importance of uh, appreciating the fact that we all process these events and we all grieve very differently. And I think it's worth acknowledging this, not just for our own self, but also for the people around us. One of the things that I have noticed, particularly on social media, is a lot of uh, finger pointing, chastising, or telling people how to behave or not to behave uh, without realizing that different uh, individuals are going through this process of grief and loss uh, in a different way. Uh, some started this process, for some, start, this process started three years ago. And they have reached a point of acceptance. Others are still in denial. Others are still uh, wondering, uh, bargaining, wondering whether, what could we have done differently, right? In addition to that, a lot of uh, people, uh, you know, may go more uh, inward, right? And be less socially uh, involved, engaged, maybe angry. Others may grieve in a different way. I, I was mentioning yesterday during a conversation, uh, one of my friends that I was checking in, uh, I was checking in with her the other day and I asked her how she's holding up and her response was, I've been watching rom-coms over the past three days. And that's, if that's her way of dealing with this challenge, that's her way of processing what is going on or uh, waiting for the right time to process what is going on, that is up to them. Uh, so I, I would perhaps uh, emphasize this, particularly since we're talking to an audience that is largely dealing with this uh, on their own, but also trying to make sense of how others are feeling at the same time. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering next, I mean, Mark introduced you very well, but I want to ask you to also introduce yourselves in the sense that I want you to talk about your research interests and what drew you to the fields you're in and where do you hope your research takes you? Okay, so I start again. Uh, um, so um, I'm a political scientist um, by training and um, my research interest is in um, the politics of memory and um, this is in so far um, timely with, um, with regard to the uh, events um, happening. Um, in the research we are doing, um, we have the assumption that um, regarding the politics of memory and genocide, um, how states and societies cope uh, with, with genocide, um, we have the assumption that um, when past crimes when genocides are dealt with in an open and self-critical um, fashion and manner, that uh, this leads to um, the prevention of new genocides. So um, that's the underlying ass assumption of, of um, why we are particularly keen on um, that, uh, that past crimes are uh, dealt with. So. However, um, and this is what I want to stress in this context, this has not so much of an evidence that um, the coping with past crimes don't lead or, or prevent new crimes. So this is uh, something that I was thinking um, uh, before the event and with regard to the um, Bergkarabakh um, um, events. 
So in that sense, um, on the one hand, I, I am looking, um, or I have dealt uh, particularly with the denial of the uh, um, Armenian genocide um, by the Turkish state and um, the majority of the Turkish uh, society, um, and try to find out um, or, or try to uh, sort out the reasons why um, Turkey is denying and how Turkey is denying. So I looked over um, time, um, fr uh, time uh, frame over a few decades from the 1970s onwards and um, um, found out that um, on the one hand, we have, we have uh, pretty much consistency in terms of denial, uh, but on the other hand, things are changing too, and um, there I looked um, for the reasons. Um, and as I said, that uh, the key point here is, um, again, that we uh, rethink the, um, the, the thinking um, how critical um, coping with, with, with past crimes can really re lead to a better future, so to say. Yeah, in my case, uh, too, perhaps the, uh, you know, growing up during the Lebanese Civil War had an impact, uh, uh, very much, I would say, the most uh, significant impact on the path that I ultimately chose. Uh, I say ultimately because I took a very meandering road through biology and clinical psychology to end up in history. And, uh, and of course, the fact that, you know, I'm a descendant of uh, survivors of the Armenian genocide. And these are things that, of course, uh, uh, are not, uh, these are decisions that are not always made consciously. These are uh, always, at the same time, negotiated with, uh, uh, with our everyday and the way in which they inform our everyday. And that's, that's how one day I found myself doing what I do right now. And, and I do uh, believe that uh, another component that sort of uh, uh, revealed itself as, uh, as time passed and as I, w I was reflecting on uh, sort of perhaps what would be my contribution to, uh, to the scholarship on the Armenian genocide, to the scholarship in general on mass violence and the history of mass violence was uh, you know, emphasizing the, the role and agency of, uh, of the victims, of the targeted, targeted group, uh, during and after uh, these, uh, these cases. And, you know, this book perhaps is one way in which that, uh, that kind of contribution also manifests itself. Um, so this book, it's titled After the Ottomans, the first part of the title. And after the Ottomans, it implies consequence, aftershock, or legacy. It also has an open-ended quality to it. So 50 years ago was after the Ottomans, and today is still considered after the Ottomans. And the second part of the title reads, Genocide's Long Shadow and Armenian Resilience. How did you arrive at this title, and what is it, or what do you hope it's communicating? Should I go first? Yes, oh yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't really recall how we arrived at this title, but I do uh, remember that we, we did consider a number of other titles leading up to this. Sehan may have a better recollection of the process, and she certainly was involved uh, earlier with that process. And, uh, but I do believe that, you know, the, the subtitle itself tries to uh, emphasize, on the one hand, the, the long shadow cast by genocide, and the ways in which communities are trying to emerge from under it, right? And uh, so it, it does highlight the, the oppressive nature of not just the crime, but it's equally and the way in which it, it impacts people's lives and the lives of generations. But the second part of the, of the subtitle essentially tries to uh, highlight the other uh, uh, perspective, which is the voices and the actions of those who uh, survived the crime and, uh, and, and spoke about it and the way in which that echoed across generations. 
and the actions that sort of uh, the survivors and the descendants uh, took in, in subsequent decades. Uh, in, in many ways, I think it's, it's important for us to be cognizant of, of that. Uh, whenever we are thinking about mass violence, even in, in today's context, right? Uh, it's important for us to, uh, to, to reflect and, and always keep as a focal point the voices and the experiences and the histories and the stories of those who are going through with this experience. And this is not something that's going to get as much attention in the media. Oftentimes policy, politics, uh, relations between states, uh, geopolitics, these are the things that sort of attract uh, experts and, and people who are reflecting on issues. And sometimes the experiences of those who are you know, essentially in the, in the, uh, at the core of this, uh, of, of any crime, uh, almost becomes just a, a setting for, uh, for, for, for everything else that I, that I just talked about. So in that regard, it's important. It's a, it's a, a good example would be uh, Armenian genocide recognition. When U.S. Congress, uh, uh, President Biden acknowledged the Armenian genocide, you know, the, in interviews, journalists were constantly asking, uh, questions related to relations between the United States and Turkey, for instance, right? Uh, or the impact this would have on, on, on relations, uh, etc. That was the emphasis, that was the obsession. Whereas the only thing I saw that that was just the major, the dominant component here was that this moment, we arrived at this moment because of the struggle of generations of Armenians, survivors and descendants who fought for this, without which not in Turkey, right? Uh, not anywhere else. People would actually uh, bother to speak about this. Government don't just, you know, say, let's look into our past and let's look into our books and see what kind of crimes we have committed and, and, and confront them or acknowledge crimes committed around the world. So I do think that, you know, the onus is often on the victims and their descendants to, to set the record straight, to make their voice heard, and, and try to say that, hold on, this is first and foremost about those who went through a particular experience and those who sort of try to shape uh, their future despite and against that. So, um, we thought thoroughly about the, the title that I remember. Um, and um, as Hrant uh, uh, already said, um, our point was to stress the aftermath in the sense that it is ongoing. Things are ongoing. It's not a process that is, um, that is um, closed. Um, and most importantly, we wanted, or from my uh, side of, um, of the um, project, it was also looking at the communities that were, or the Armenian community that were really left, particularly in Turkey, alone after the um, after the genocide. So that was um, um, our aim to um, to to look at the repercussions, and or or the stress, the the ongoing, the impact of the genocide um, on on future generations, and that that the um, discrimination. On the in within Turkey went onwards, and what I um, want to uh, want to also stress is what um, Hachik said, uh, or second it so so to say is um, it is indeed uh, the case that in no perhaps until the 2000s there the things changed, but until then there was almost no instance I would even say no instance where there was a, a discussion from within Turkey about the Armenian genocide, about what happened to the Armenians, and also about um, nothing about the Armenian Armenian um, citizens of Turkey. So in that sense, it was really the um, collective uh, memory politics of, of the Armenian community, be it in Turkey, not, not in Turkey, of course, but um, particularly in the diaspora to, um, to to revive and to um, to prevent the, the genocide from uh, being forgotten. So these um, activities were, were political um, political commemorative um, activities plus politics to to uh, to 
um, to reach uh, political acknowledgements by, by governments, and of course it was also the, um, the militant pa part of the struggle for, um, for memory um, and for justice. And in, in the, the, these, uh, all these had in so far um, major effects, um, some more, some uh, others less, but it ha had major ef effects on the long run in the sense that the uh, memory um, or about the genocide got not um, lost. Um, you write that this volume privileges micro over macro histories. Um, how so and why was that important? And maybe what do you consider a micro history? Um, so, um, as I said, we, we wanted to focus on what is happening on the ground, um, on the ground and uh, what happens, how do the survivors, uh, survivors go on with um, their lives in, after the genocide. So, um, we provided uh, the framework of, of uh, in the, in the uh, well, volumes before, the framework was the framework was set in the sense that the genocide was a really defining act um, in 1915, which had um, effects beyond beyond the genocide itself. So, but on the region. So, we uh, the, the framework was to shift the perspective uh, from a very European-centered um, centered approach to, his, to, his, to the history of the First, first World War, and um, to focus on the um, structural outcomes of the genocide for the for the region, not only for the um, for for Turkey. So. That was uh, the, the frame, for, uh, so to say, for our collection, um, where we say that we um, privilege the micro, micro um, experiences, and, and we have a few, um, a few contributions that uh, that deal with family history. Um, a few. One is um, uh, dealing with family history. Um, the other is your uh, contribution with uh, with uh, um, so civil societal um, activities on, on the ground and in Turkey with different groups to remember the genocide. Then we have the writers, um, the Armenian writers, uh, who um, are very important in the keeping up of the of the memory. So that was our um, point to. Um, have the have the frame of of uh, that the genocide is not an insular thing and affecting only one community, but that it has has more uh, more impact impact in the region and um, besides this, the the micro experiences um, of of um, Armenian actors, so to say. Yeah, what are, if I can add just like maybe one uh, one quick point. Uh, many, most of the chapters in the book essentially try to zoom in on one event, your chapter, or uh, you know, one family, or one region, and essentially uh, present uh, through that experience and through the, the, the study of that particular case, uh, you know, reflections, thoughts, ideas that would further uh, you know, enrich our understanding of the bigger, you know, bigger picture of the experience of genocide and its legacy. And in certain cases, uh, we're really talking micro histories in, in terms of really zooming into the experience of one family and uh, across uh, a few generations or in, in one context. And in others, it's, as I said, an event. It's, it's, it's one region. Uh, my contribution largely uh, focuses on Syria until, and then uh, the diaspora uh, more broadly. Uh, but again, the, the intention here is to try to, uh, one, create this kind of intimate, right, uh, connection with, with uh, the event and its aftermath. And the second is to try to be able to then zoom out and uh, allow that experience sort of inform our appreciation of the big picture. 
Um, Sehan, I think this next question is for you. Um, you focused on denial in Turkey, um, and it's like a whole atmosphere, culture, everything. There's, it supports that denial, which what Talin Sujian calls the habitus mm -hmm. of denial. Um, and you trace it in your chapter um, through the legal means of, that the country uses, um, as well as in text and what is referred to there as the Armenian issue. Um, you've also charted Turkey's official stand, per, stance, particularly as influenced by its ambitions of EU accession. Um, and for Erdogan's calls for a joint Armenian-Turkish history commission. Um, could you discuss some of these taxes, th tactics and their effectiveness? So first of all, um, Um, I start with a f summary of, of my findings so that we have the um, big picture. Um, the first thing is when it comes to the genocide denial uh, by Turkey, um, the first thing is that um, memory never took place, as I said, um, from within, um, from the ma majority of the, um, of the society itself or the Turkish state. So it was always a reaction to, to external triggers, mostly commemorational events, and particularly the militant attacks on, um, on Turkish consul, uh, consular people and um, uh, Turkish state um, actors caused, uh, caused, of course, um, um, repercussions in the Turkish discourse or the t Turkish memory about uh, the Armenian genocide. Um, the Turkish state, uh, adopted to, um, to all these instances more or less um, reactively, um, so that was not, a, um, had, had no effect, or, or not, not a dynamic from within, um, as I said. The second thing was, um, or the second uh, important thing is that over the time, when we look how the genocide is remembered, we have pretty much, um, stable discourse patterns. So this, these don't change over time that much, just nuances. So we have, we have uh, special pictures that uh, emerge from the 1970s until the beginning of the 2000s. That is mostly Armenians. Our Armenians are good. Um, the diaspora Armenians are, uh, bur uh, are bad, revenge-driven, et cetera. Um, or, and the other picture is that of Armenian terrorism. So whenever, the, um, whenever even, even um, non-militant um, uh, events pop up, um, the first thing that is, um, that is remembered in relation to the genocide is, um, the, um, is, is Armenian terrorism. So, um, the key point here is that discourse patterns, particularly that of um, Armenian terrorism, survives the times of actual terrorist attacks. So, um, and they also um, are carried not only by state actors as, um, as arguments against the genocide, so to say, but uh, they, are, um, they are shared by the majority of the of the society, so to say. So that's the second thing. The third is um, that despite these um, this continuity and stable patterns, we nevertheless have changes, uh, small changes um, in the state's practices, in the, uh, the the reaction of the state to these, so to say, to challenges of um, or the charges of, um, uh, of, of genocide. So in the 1980s, uh, the state um, is institutional, institutionalizing its, um, its uh, anti-acknowledgement uh, um, practices. In the 2000s, it's, it's, uh, it gets different again, so. And the fourth uh, and important um, mm, aspect of the genocide, the history of genocide denial is that 
uh, over the time we have a diversification of people taking part in the in the discourse as well. So um, while we have uh, only state actors or officials speaking about the genocide um, until uh, around um, end of the 1990s, in the 2000s, that picture gets totally different. Different in the sense that we have a much broader. Um, P, um, social social groups talking about uh, or having to talk about the, the genocide that is uh, mostly journalists and academics um, that is uh, also members of the Armenian community particularly uh, Ranting and um, Etienne Machupian they get visible um, the, uh, in the in the uh, discourse about about the genocide itself. Uh, so visible that uh, with the with the ex extreme tragic um, uh, results that Hrant Dink is, gets killed and really um, without being too pathetic has the costs for this vis visibility is is his life. So um, that's a, that's a general picture with uh, with with uh, coping with 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 the past in in Turkey so mostly reactive but in the 2000s the picture gets uh, different different because in um, the uh, the uh, Turkey um, is accept, accepted as the EU um, candidate um, and this is a major breakthrough in um, Turkish history and um, history and it's a critical moment in the sense that Turkey uh, it looks like that Turkey can get into the EU after 40 years of being on the waiting bench but um, with within the process the uh, uh, Armenian genocide um, turns to a very um, important um, debate in uh, European um, member states and um, uh, because of of the, uh, it, it turns to an uh, important um, argument, but I, before I have to say uh, that the fact itself that um, the uh, Turkey can, can get into the EU um, results in very, very heated debates in, um, within the EU and in, public, uh, public, in the publics of the EU because um, the European ability of Turkey is is in que question. The the critics of um, the critics of an EU entry then, but not uh, yeah then uh, turn use mostly the Armenian genocide and the denial of the genocide as uh, an argument um, that the EU the Turkey is not culturally European enough, but nevertheless the uh, pressure for, on Turkey is so high because the European Parliament is um, time and again um, calling for acknowledgement. Um, the, the public debates are like, uh, like that, I, I said. And in the reaction to that, um, Turkey manages to open uh, signal openness. Um, it it uh, suggests to critical uh, points and in um, proactively, so to say, um, before critical uh, instances, it, it, it suggests, for example, the uh, setup of, the, of a history um, commission, or it approaches Armenia, or it uh, engages in symbolic politics like the soccer diplomacy. And when, you, when we look at the process, it's very close to the, to, to the, to the options and the pressure that comes from, from particularly the EU. Um, in these cases where, so to say, Turkey opens up or signals opening up, Turkey manages also the growing awareness within, um, within Turkey about the, the growing awareness and the social, societal um, discourse. Uh, it manages to use this discourse as an argument um, against or for the European public that something is happening in Turkey and Turkey is not open, but it's not a taboo, top a taboo topic anymore to talk about the Armenian genocide. So this is a very um, tactical and strategic approach to the, to the genocide um, 
in terms of what is different than in, in earlier phases where um, as Turkey was only reactive, but in the, in the 2000s that, that changes. And it is in so far successful that it diverts somehow the, the, um, from the fact that Turkey is still um, at its core denying the genocide, uh, but the European publics and or in the public uh, debates, it's like, because of the internal uh, dynamic, it looks like uh, that things change more substantially than they do, they, than they in fact do. Is that somehow? Yes, thank you. <laughs> and we'll, we'll probably talk more about denial later. Um, but my next question is for Khachik. Uh, in your chapter, you write about the various types of books Armenians published something that Valentina Calzolari also discusses in her chapter. The Hushamadian memorial books are unique. One man wrote a 2,000-page book on Aintab. Another man wrote a 181-page volume on a village that housed 25 households. These fa facts speak to the scope of the loss. You wrote about the sense of urgency that drove their authors. They were terrified that their towns and villages would be forgotten. Uh, what were all these books trying to accomplish? What would you say, like, would you say they succeeded? And do you see your work as part of this tradition? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Well, I'm, I'm not sure how to define success in, in, this, in this context, but uh, perhaps one example would be just an hour ago as we were walking uh, in the Nasser Library. There was a corner for uh, memorial books. So these are books that were published uh, in the aftermath of the Armenian Genocide by the survivors about their ancestral homes, towns. Uh, you know, sometimes these are massive volumes. Other times they're, you know, shorter uh, publications that look at the customs, culture, uh, genealogy, history, uh, traditions, prominent figures, uh, of uh, a particular village and town. And the idea at a time when you do not have internet, you do not have ways of recreating digitally uh, spaces, was essentially to uh, recreate in, in book form and pass on to, the, to subsequent generations uh, what was lost and what was left behind during the genocide and its aftermath. So in many ways, the Hushamadian, the memorial book, was uh, one thing that people carried with them and hoped that it sort of was the embodiment of what was left behind. Uh, so, so we see in this, uh, in, in this Hushamadian uh, tradition, we're, not, we're talking about books in a number of languages, Armenian, English, French, uh, in the hundreds, several hundred such books, as well as periodicals and others. It is sort of an, an, uh, an effort to uh, preserve and pass along uh, this history. And uh, in, in many ways, it's very, and this is perhaps one of the indicators of what success would mean, uh, it, it is an important part of uh, the Armenian experience in the diaspora and back home, and in a couple ways. One is that this genre has never died. In fact, to this day, it manifests itself both in terms of publications about these villages and towns that continue reprints, new manuscripts that are emerge, emerging and being published. And second, uh, the fact that there, is now, there are now digital initiatives in recent decades, most prominently hushamadian.org, that tries to do the same thing you know, online. Uh, and, and ultimately, uh, you know, it does help in, uh, and it plays a critical role in creating this kind of connection to, to the ancestral land, ancestral home, you see this because even in households, say, where Armenian is no longer speaking, uh, Armenian is no longer spoken, uh, you will find these Armenian language books on one's ancestral homes and towns, which is treated almost as a sacred artifact, right? So for, for, for people, it is a piece of home, and it has all the, it's this magical book that sort of, uh, you know, essentially carries you back into that place. And for most people, uh, you know, in the diaspora and uh, in Armenia as well, 
That is what they think of when they think of their ancestral land. When they think of Eintab, when they think of Van and, 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 and Mush or tiny villages, right? It's not, you know, it's not what exists there today, but it is what is carried and passed on through, uh, primarily through these books. It, is, it, it also reminds me very much of uh, what's going on today. You know, one of the images that really has stuck with me from the second Artsakh war uh, three years ago was this photograph of, an, uh, as Armenians were fleeing uh, uh, the region, uh, was this photograph of an Armenian driving a truck, and on the truck is this small house. So he's literally carrying his house with him as he's escaping, as he's uh, leaving Artsakh. In many ways, you know, a lot, most people could not take anything with them when they left during the Armenian genocide. And uh, this was a way in which they rebuilt that house in, in the diaspora and uh, in whatever countries they called their new home. And I, I can't help but think, I mean, you know, we're reading of people fleeing right now and most of them aren't able to bring anything with them. Um, and I hate the thought, but uh, just thinking about what books we'll end up with in the future from this ordeal. Um, both Atatürk, we're going to Atatürk now, both Atatürk and Erdogan stand out in the history of Turkey as formidable personalities that insist on changing the course of history. In his chapter, for instance, Kieser mentions a fascinating speech Kemal delivered in 1927. The speech is in the first person where the I is the nation. In other words, Kemal was speaking as the nation. He was able to build a personality cult that is still going strong. Erdogan is now challenging it. What parallels or differences may be drawn between these two personalities? <laughs> um, so first of all, I think that um, Erdogan wants to be the better, a better Atatürk than um, than his predecessor. So um, there are major differences between these two, but in terms of personality cult and charisma, they're very close. So um, while we have um, a, a personal cult, and um, I mean, Atatürk is namely the father of the Turks that is already saying a lot about the cult of um, Mustafa Kemal um, for the Turkish people. Uh, but it's the same with, with Erdogan. He has a mass base, and what makes him um, different from Atatürk is that the politics or that what he is doing have a more of a mass base. He's, he's a p kind of a person from bottom up. He is from totally different, uh, totally different context. He's a uh, context in the sense that um, he's a Muslim and pious person, wh wh whereas that was the uh, anti, anti thesis, so to say, it, um, of, uh, to, to Atatürk and, uh, or Mustafa Kemal. So Mustafa Kemal, um, uh, approach to politics was from um, top down, um, all the reform, uh, reforms and um, the uh, new beginnings are forced and from top down, no, um, no basis. Erdogan is um, in the meantime the uh, number, uh, a one man ruler, uh, de facto, he has a, a lot of power, but um, his rule is more based on on um, societal uh, on a on a societal consensus in the sense that he has more um, of a, of a, his his approach has more so, um, num numerical wise more support. So, um, in terms of ideology, they're of course very different. Um, the one um, is radical, uh, radically um, approached not approach, but um, a uh, secular and um, 
Western-oriented um, um, person and he wants to um, westernize uh, Turkey and um, Erdogan is not against um, uh, West westernization but he is more, um, he is not, uh, how to say it, um, uh, it must be also grounded with the, uh, with, uh, um, culture, with the conservative culture of, of Turkey. So I think they have in common that um, their charismatic um, appearance and their um, appeal to, to, to the people. But yeah, in terms of ideology, they're of course very different. Well, coming to ideology and this vocabulary is part of ideology, I suppose. In your introduction, you refer to the neo-Ottoman vocabulary in today's Turkey. What do you mean by it? Um, and is this a new development? Um, a new development in the sense that this is a development with the AKP party. So um, it's a development from starting with, with, uh, with uh, new, new leaders, but not from the beginning. So they're um, reigning since uh, the governing since 2002, 2003, I, um, I think, the AKP government. Um, and this Neo-Ottomanism uh, came about um, after a few years that uh, after they were in in uh, in, um, in power. Um, perhaps one example that is very telling in this context, in the Armenian context, um, is that uh, um, as the restoration of the of as, as the AKP um, started to restore the church in Aktamar. Um, with, which was, by the way, one of the symbolic actions um, what, uh, what I tried to uh, explain earlier, um, and which was to appease, not appease, but um, it, which was to appeal um, European uh, Europe as um, having, having a, a more open approach to the, to the past. Um, the opening of the church was um, presented under the heading of tolerance, of um, which is exactly a, an Ottoman notion. Notion. So it was not uh, uh, in line, or it was not propagated as as European norms of whatever democratization or um, minority rights. But it was what was presented as um, that. Turkey is a tolerant nation. Um, there is a very, is a very um, good um, essay on this by Bilgi Nayata, who is exactly looking at this, this um, aspect, uh, how the church was was presented, and um, that it was not a norm in, uh, internalization, a European norm that was inter internalized, but it was an Ottoman, uh, a revival of Ottoman. Um, 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 Ottoman practices, yeah. So, neo-Ottomanism is um, new and not new. New and not new. But practiced, yeah. yeah. Um, I think I'm gonna switch a little bit from the book, and also, I mean, you can draw from the book on this. Um, you've done extensive research on Armenian loss, resilience, and resistance. I want to ask you about Artsakh, um, but the thing is, I'm not sure if I know what the right question is. And I think that the questions we ask now may be more important than the answers. So I will ask you what is or are the right questions and why? Uh. I, I'm not a very, a very prescriptive person, so I will not say what are the right questions, but I do, uh, but I can say uh, that uh, I, I think one of the important uh, challenges for us right now is to identify not just the right questions, but also the time to ask, uh, what question to ask when. I do think that we are at a moment uh, where because of the chaos, the confusion, grief, disillusionment. We are uh, trying to do everything at, at the same time. And 
it's and and it's 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 natural, but I do think that uh, there are important questions to be asked when it comes to uh, first. Uh, the first would be, I would say, introspection, and not introspection. Introspection as individuals, and introspection as communities. Uh, I think is going to be critical, right? Uh, before pointing fingers at anybody else, even if this is not something we are comfortable in actually externalizing, at least uh, having a reflection about uh, our own uh, failures in uh, over the past three decades, right? From the first war, uh, and, 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 and three decades of Armenian statehood and, uh, and the role that the Armenian diaspora played uh, in, in, in this regard. And I think there are some uh, tough questions that we need to ask ourselves in this regard. Uh, and again, I say this, uh, you know, because th there's a lot of calls nowadays for accountability, and that's, that's very important. But ultimately, the most pure form of accountability comes when you are you know, alone in your room and you're asking this question to yourself, of yourself, all right, how, and how did I fail in this process? Because I doubt that any one of us actually did not fail. Uh, and of course, those who are in positions of power failed even more miserably and the implications of their failure had a lot more of an impact but we're all uh, complicit in it in one way or the other. And uh, this makes people uncomfortable. And, and I've had a lot of conversations about this with friends and colleagues over the past, uh, well, days and also over the past three years. And it makes us uncomfortable because it's, uh, it says, well, you know, look at that and look at that and look at the extent of, of damage that was caused by these individuals and by this legacy, et cetera. But ultimately, I think, if we're going to start somewhere, that is where we're going to start. First, because there is a place where we have the most control, right? Uh, you know, uh, first, ourselves and our behavior and our future actions. Second, our own communities and the way in which our own communities shape their future actions, right? Uh, this whole talk about, you know, the agency and the resilience and the, and the importance of voice and action is not something that we only say in retrospect about what happened 100 years ago. It is very much also part of our reality today. Uh, are we going to assume responsibility for this or are we going to portray ourselves as victims of geopolitical winds that somehow swept us and uh, cast our Armenian nation, right, uh, in, in this or that direction? I'm not saying that uh, we had the kind of transformative power that could essentially stand against sometimes extremely strong winds. But at the same time, I'm saying that every step of the way, we had the ability and we had uh, the, of, uh, of ha having a more definitive say and a more critical impact and we let the opportunity go. Second is that of course, and this is, uh, these are all things that are easy to uh, reflect on in retrospect, but at the same time, uh, uh, and to forget about in, in moments of victory and success, right? I mean, in moments of victory of success and success, we don't generally sit down and reflect on what went, may have gone wrong or what may go wrong down the road. But I do think that uh, uh, it's, it is the, the most important time to get into that reflection when you are, uh, when you have the upper hand, right? Uh, but 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 now, right now, we have what we have, and I do think, uh, just to sort of uh, wrap it up, I, I I do have the tendency to go on and on when I when somehow someone presses this button. Uh, I I do think, first and foremost, before. Uh, talking about the Russians and Azerbaijan and Turkey and the United States and the West and being ignored and neglected and being left alone. I think it's very important to just uh, hold ourselves accountable and, uh, and, and draw from there, uh, and I repeat, this doesn't have to be public and open. I do believe that for public figures, 
And for political leaders, it has to be something that is aired out. There's no other way to deal with this. You know, for a nation that talks so much about denial, there's a lot of denial in our communities. And I do think that it's important to confront this. Uh, so, so yes, I do think we need to start from within. Uh, ourselves, our communities, and as, as we look uh, ahead for the decades to come. Absolutely. Um, now, I will maybe take it to one of the geopolitical winds you mentioned, uh, Turkey. <laughs> well, Turkey's denial of the genocide. Well, let me first say that as this is unfolding in Artsakh, as people are forced to flee, and um, we saw Erdogan visiting Nakhichevan, and they did a groundbreaking ceremony of a military something center and a gas pipeline. Um, and so I want to turn to Turkey and ask about Turkey's denial of the genocide and its consequences beyond memory on um, the dynamics, the regional dynamics and the policies of Turkey and what the wider consequences are of Ankara's policies and also the discourse inside Turkey today. How, how, how is the discourse regarding this issue? Um. I mean, you don't have to look to Ankara um, for um, standing next to Aliyev, but you can look to uh, Europe too, you know. Like, this is nothing about, uh, not about um, an outcome of denial or Turkish politics, it's geopolitics, so this is the first thing. The second thing is, I think it's, um, and there I wanna come to, to your um, question before, what are the right questions to, um, to, to, um, to pose? I think before starting to question anything, the most important thing is to be just practic and practical and pragmatic. So what we can do is um, really think about what we can do on the spot. I mean, I don't, what, what, how can we mobilize, uh, mobilize help? Uh, before theorizing about um, about what comes next. So I think this is a very urgent situation. I mean, I don't have to tell you that. Um, before, yeah, before um, talking about why it or um, how it could be prevented, I think it's, it's really important to sort out ways to mobilize and to help. And also what is extremely important, also very frustrating is to, um, to generate uh, more public awareness of this um, of this happening, because I know from Europe that um, half of um, the um, Bakarabah people were starving out, and nobody was listening. There are only a handful of journalists who uh, keep talking about it, but but it, there is no repercussion. So this is something where we um, where this is something that. Um, is is in need um, is very immediate. And um, back to your question to uh, um, Erdogan, yeah, as I said, this is also it's um, a little, of course, more hurting than its uh, perpetrators. Um, it's the perpetrators um, most important representative standing next to the probably next perpetrator. That is definitely uh, hurting, but um, here we have to open up. There is so much more complicity to this, um, to the happenings in, in Bergkarabach than what is, um, than only, only um, Erdogan or Turkey without wanting to, to diminish the, the, the um, responsibility of Turkey. Um, my point is that there is more responsibility to others and particularly the European Union uh, who is backing, who backed the um, Aliyev regime and uh, after, after the Ukrainian, so that the responsibility is more than um, just on Turkey's side. I have so many more questions, but I think, um, I think maybe it's time for your questions. Yes, and if I may, I will, I will do this 
I will take, uh, I will ask Zoom questions from here and I will use this microphone so I don't have to steal one of your microphones. However, to the people in the room, I'm not monopolizing the microphone and if you would like to ask a question, please get up, gently tap me on the shoulder and say, get out of the way, please. I'd like to ask a question. So this is from Zoom, uh, from a Zoom viewer. Uh, Sehan stated that in Turkey no one really spoke up about the Armenian genocide before the 2000s, but the, the, the viewer remembers that uh, Turkish President Turgut Uzal, Uzal uh, in the 1980s, I believe, ha had at least contemplated creating a commission and, and uh, formulating a kind of outreach to, to the Armenian diaspora as a way of trying to resolve this issue. Can you, can you talk about some of that, uh, that earlier moment when maybe things might have gone in a different direction or maybe not? Okay. So my point was that um, these uh, that activities of, of the Turkish state were, were not from, um, there was no sense of a feeling that um, one has to tackle the, the um, Armenian genocide. This initiative of uh, Özal um, was also as a reaction to the acknowledgement politics of the, of the Armenian, uh, Armenian diaspora, particularly the United States. The 1980s are a period where, where we have almost on a yearly basis acknowledgement moves in the U United States. So as a, as a danger or as the argument of Armenian terrorism was not that um, vital or so um, strong anymore from the, for the for the Turkish side um, that um, there were other other there were uh, steps perhaps um, to to not to solve the issue but to divert the attention to um, look as if one is uh, effective or and uh, initi initiative in terms of 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 um, to to prevent genocide acknowledgement. So that was the point, perhaps. Khatshig and Sehan will both remember that going back 10, 15 years ago when there was maybe more of an open debate and discussion about these issues going on between and among Armenian and Turkish intellectuals that there was a, a uh, a line in the discourse uh, among many of the, the Turkish intellectuals that refused to essentially uh, acknowledge what, what your main point is, Sehan, that the, the, the discussion that was taking place was engendered by the, the force of, of, of Armenian action mostly in, in the diaspora. And, and I don't know if, if that point has been conceded now by 2023 or, or not, and I wondered if you could talk about that. Is, that, is it still resisted that uh, your, essentially your thesis mm -hmm. here, or, or is it more accepted among the, many of the uh, more progressive Turkish intellectuals? Um. So I, I don't know that I can't I can't um, can't tell you anything about if there is a switch in in opinion about that. But what I can tell is, um, of course, there is a there is room for here and there having missed something. But I looked a period of from the 1970s to 2000s at critical uh, moments, like um, looked. Um, for example, every 23rd April, not 24th, every 23rd April, if, if something comes up regarding the Armenian genocide. So for a long period, this um, research doesn't result in any, any um, text about the Armenian genocide. Only when there were happenings outside of Turkey that um, then discussion t took place as a forced, a forced discussion. So, for that part, I want, just want to stress there is no, um, no option to say we did something. There was nothing. I mean, there was nothing. So in the 2000s, that has changed totally. So this is so vibrant. There is so much memory talk that that, that um, dominates, so to say, um, the, the picture of what is going on in Turkey in terms of memory. So 
in, in the 2000s, we have a different picture, but, but if before that was, that was more of a silence and a forced um, remembering. Yeah, if I can add to it, I would say that, uh, you know, one of the things, one of the reasons perhaps that the Armenian, uh, that the, one of the reasons there was no acknowledgement that the very fact that there is conversation about the Armenian genocide in the beginning in the 2000s in Turkey is largely because over generations and uh, there was this persistent pressure and, the, you know, by the descendants of the victims who were speaking up, who were pressuring, who were writing the books, published oftentimes into, you know, speaking into the abyss, right? And, uh, and this, was, this was not acknowledged because somewhere there was this kind of uh, uh, sense that for many of the scholars and journalists and others uh, who were speaking out in the beginning of 2000 in Turkey that they are the people who are breaking the silence, right? And it's not because, uh, you know, so, there, so somehow uh, it would take away from the, 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 you know, the shiny, the moment to shine to say, by the way, we've been hearing this for decades and suddenly we realized it. And instead they're saying we're the first people to speak about I mean, one of the most, there was a time when one of the most popular and often cited quotes in, in, the, in the press and also among Armenians was Orhan Pamuk's sentence, right? One million Armenians were killed, 30,000 Kurds were killed, and nobody except me is talking about it. And that sentence sort of is the embodiment of that kind of narcissism, right? Uh, sorry for Orhan Pamuk. But um, uh, my point being that oftentimes it is about this kind of, uh, you know, it's, you know, like we are breaking the silence and you should be thankful for it. And, and that, I think, uh, is, is something that over time to sort of bring back even closer to your uh, question, has gradually shifted. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's not there, but I do think that there, is, there has been enough uh, individuals, intellectuals, both within Turkey and outside, who made this point that there is a, a little bit more of a tacit acknowledgement of that fact. Here too, again, I would like to emphasize the role of Armenians and their own, uh, because oftentimes, when Ar uh, Armenians are addressing these issues, uh, they feel like, uh, they feel more validated when it's a non-Armenian who speaks about their experience. And, or even more so when it's uh, uh, someone from Turkey or, you know, uh, who, who's speaking about their experience. And therefore there is this sense of, uh, let me, uh, you know, give the days and the mic and the spotlight, put the spot, spotlight on this person who's suddenly coming and, you know. So, so there is, uh, again, a role to not all, you know, to go back to the same point that I keep making today. It's, we have a role in this, to, to speak up on, on, on issues like this. And, you know, there's people in the audience here, Lerna, uh, Henry Terrio, and others, you know, who've written and talked about this as well. So I, I, but I do think this is critical, uh, the way in which we, we enable this, or we sort of try to uh, be cognizant of the dynamics and say we're appreciative, but. Please. Hello, good evening. Um, thank you for letting me be in your space today. My name is Bria Hardin Boyer, and Dr. Moradian was my professor in 2018, so it's good to see you again. Um, my, I have a twofold question. Um, the first one, how we were, spe we're speaking about the memory. Um, how can allies participate in helping with sharing this me memory, healing those wounds? That's the first question. The second question, how do you want your works to be remembered by the next generation 50 years from now? Thank you. Thank you. All right. You use the floor. Okay. One for each. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, thank you for being here, Bria. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question. I, I would say, I, I would give the same response no matter what case we are talking about. So in this case, we're talking about the Armenian genocide. I think in an ever uh, connected world, and in a world that is uh, a lot more informed every minute of what is going on, uh, our, uh, 
you know, it's, it's all the more important, all the more imperative, and also our responsibilities in circumstances where there are major uh, human rights violations and crimes being committed for us to be, to be engaged and involved, right? In however ways and whatever ways we, we can. And uh, just as, uh, you know, Armenian Americans who are citizens of this country cannot uh, extricate themselves from uh, the past, the blemishes, the crimes, slavery, destruction of Native Americans, uh, that is very much part of these lands, right? Uh, I think that, uh, you know, as the United States as a, a, a superpower, but also Americans, uh, who have the ability and the resources and the means and the voice to, to express it. It is important for them to be informed and to be part, part of this, uh, part of the, the, the struggle, right? I'm not one who thinks that we do have, we all have the bandwidth to uh, be part of all struggles and be constantly in this process, but I, I am one who believes that we all can do our bit to sort of, uh, and, and oftentimes it doesn't take that much, right? To, to put pressure, to apply pressure on our government, uh, on our uh, legislature, uh, to, to, to move the needle, or to, in, again, in ever-connected uh, space, uh, you know, use social media and other ways and inform ourselves, right? I think the first act and it's, it, it can, it's almost like a revolutionary act that we can engage in is actually being formed in, uh, in, a, in, a, in an environment when, where there's so much noise, in an, particularly in this particular case in, uh, where there are major interests and powers that are uh, trying to uh, magnify that noise in order to make things get lost in detail. I, I do think that uh, to sort of uh, focus uh, my response, being uh, informed comes first. Uh, being, uh, not thinking that we need to transform and shift and move something, trans you know, playing our little bit would be critical uh, because those, it is the incremental, uh, you know, the cumulative impact of that little bit that actually transforms things. Uh, and, and realizing that this is a long haul. And uh, on the long haul, uh, uh, struggles that are uh, intersectional, struggles, all struggles are intersectional. Struggles that, uh, that actually, that are successful are going to be the ones that uh, bring different coalitions, different groups, uh, different like-minded people together. And this goes counter to some of the, the, the environment we are in right now in the here and now as far as the Artsakh war. Because a lot of also what we are hearing has to do with the fact that we are alone, we have to be uh, you know, powerful and focus on ourselves and not rely on others, etc. And this is all important, right? This, this is important, an important part of the conversation. But uh, also the worst thing we can do, right, is just you know, close into ourselves, circle the wagons, and I do think that uh, outreach from other communities, other groups, other activists will make that uh, easier for the Armenian community as well in a time when uh, there is this sense of abandonment. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I second <laughs> Top, uh, Hachik's answer. There was a second question, though, about yes. how do you want to remember, Possibly. be remembered? Oh, yes. how do I? Um, I mean, I don't want to be remembered particularly because I don't think that I'm that important at all. I mean, not uh, because I'm very um, modest now, but uh, just to be realistic and it's okay. But um, I, I think I have a, I made a little bit of a contribution to uh, growing awareness, and that that that's my my contribution that is doesn't need to be remembered but um, it's my little bit of contribution yeah if you have a question uh, just you're gonna have to come to the mic okay. yes 
Hi there, thank you everyone, thank you both. Um, I want to thank Sehan for pointing out the importance of the immediate needs and immediate questions about how to help people. I think um, particularly for groups in the diaspora who have been very active in the war, it's easy to, in the grief, to be both concerned for the people suffering now as well as what was done wrong or right in the past. And it's important to just focus on saving the people. Um, and the other flip side to not necessarily looking to other groups to validate Armenian suffering or issues, the flip side is that it seems like when Armenians speak up and ask or, or alert the international public media about, look what's going on, this is going, not going to end good, you know, do something, it's all ignored until the horrible happens and then suddenly now Samantha Power is there. You know, it's like, where were they when this thing was happening? Why are they always waiting till the catastrophe happens in, in order to get concerned. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I share your, uh, your, your sentiment uh, wholly. I, you know, uh, as someone who has, uh, you know, for, uh, especially early on in my teaching career, has, has, has used Samantha Power's book and has followed her career. Uh, as a journalist, I've interviewed her several times. It's, uh, it's, it's very difficult for me uh, to watch her in that position, and uh, and, and to see that the United States, you know, uh, you know, her representing the United States is announcing something like 11 million dollars of humanitarian assistance, which is, uh, you know, uh, as you know, on the way here, Nanor was pointing out that it's just the cost of a couple of uh, houses on the way on the road, uh, is 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 extremely embarrassing and. As uh, Armenian Americans, and I think as, as Americans, uh, in, in general, we, uh, we, there, there's no other reaction to it, right? I also second your point about uh, the immediate uh, priority being absolutely uh, assistance and support to the Armenians of Artsakh, no matter where they are, period. Uh, but also, I would say, in addition to that, uh, not forgetting that we are, wherever we are, as Armenians now, uh, we are in communities that are grieving. And they are, uh, uh, and, and that's also important to attend to. And in fact, these two are connected. I think it's, uh, you know, doing it, uh, doing our best in that process of supporting the uh, those affected by this by this horror in Artsakh uh, will also uh, help with with the other. Uh, you know, I, I had this sort of an outburst earlier about you know issues of responsibility, etc. And then I was reflecting about it, and I, I guess I am still s stuck in this bargaining phase of my my you know my grief, right? Uh, this this phase of saying I'm I'm still in the phase of what if kind of uh, period. So, and, and somehow you were subjected to it. But that's the, that's the reality. We are all uh, going through this process and we are uh, in, in different stages of it, right? Uh, and this is going to be, uh, uh, you know, one that, this is not something that's going to, to go away easily. And it's going to take a, lo a long time for this. Uh, all we need to do is ask our grandparents about what they went through and how long that took. But at the same time, uh, another thing we can ask them is about resilience and, and rebuilding and look around and, and see the legacy of what they have left us and, uh, and, and try to move it forward. In a world where, uh, you know, coalitions matter, working together matters, bringing different groups together matters, I, I do think that we're even better positioned to, uh, you know, to recover from this. Uh, than our ancestors more than a century ago. Uh, thank you, and I, and I don't mean to pull away from the book, but I think this might tie into 
some of the issues. So I want to push back in a very loving way at Hachig because we, oh, please we may disagree, <laughs> but, but it, we're trying to model the right kind of behavior, I think, for Armenian communities right now um, in an era where we've seen over the last three years a kind of horrible, angry, um, unproductive discourse that, that really doesn't deal with issues in, 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 a, in a way that's at all going to help anybody. Um, but I want to push back a little bit. I, I absolutely think you're right in terms of people in power and their accountability. People in power who, who choose to get political power are making a bargain for status for that power and so forth to accept that accountability, that responsibility. Um, but I'm wondering if we want to maybe push the idea of denial and memory a little bit more to say that there are also healthy forms of forgetting. Um, and I think we're so caught up in memory sometimes and we're so caught up in fighting denial that we forget we can turn that off once in a while. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, the average person, I agree with you, we, you know, I, I could have done more. I'm, I'm thinking of conversations I had with people a few years ago saying, why are you still talking about the genocide? Our talk is what matters and me not really getting that until 2019, 2020, and it was too late by then. Um, but thinking about the fact that average folks, the vast majority of Armenians, really honestly probably couldn't have tipped the scales. I mean, geopolitics is real. The demographic destruction of the genocide is real. I mean, the, the, why genocide in part is so effective is because it really reduces the, the future power of, of the victims relative to others. So do you, would you entertain the idea that maybe there's a very complicated way we need to think about in this moment based on the work that you've done regarding 100 years ago, very complicated way we need to think about memory and forgetting. And, and actually, I, I want to turn it over to, to everybody. Um, and, and if so, how, how do you see that? How do, how do we deal with this moment in that way? Uh, again, I don't want to be prescriptive about how people uh, should go through this. Uh, but let me make a couple of things. Uh, I, I was very honest with the fact that this is where I am right now. And, uh, but at the same time, I'd like to say that when I said we have to reflect on our own role and responsibility, I wasn't talking about uh, the way in which we could have tipped the scale in, these geop in this geopolitical environment. What I was talking about is, you know, a lot, and I was just saying that about uh, coalitions and uh, solidarity as well, is about the ways in which for three decades, uh, I believe all of us have uh, essentially outsourced a lot uh, to uh, certain decision-making centers. We have taken a lot for granted and we have gone into some kind of business as usual uh, kind of mode where uh, it was sort of, there was like some kind of conspiracy of silence and nobody wanted to say, but hold on, right? So just to give an example, it might be an exaggerated example, it might, it might hurt a little bit, but it's worth giving, right? Uh, you know, all, on all those occasions when uh, after the first war in Artsakh uh, and, and, and victory in the first war in Artsakh, right? Where almost blinded by that victory, right? For three decades, you know, everyone was in this sense that this can never happen. You know, this, uh, you know, this is, uh, we, we won and we'll win again next time and it's gonna get even worse if they try. How many times have we heard this? Uh, and and it's, 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 it's easy uh, to not, uh, and, and you know, it's a reality. The other thing has to do with the ways the unhealthy relationship between Armenia and the diaspora. Again, it contributed to what happened. Significantly, because ultimately, if we, because there's two options here. One is that Armenia ultimately had no choice and this is inevitable, and we had no agency, and there's nothing we could have done in the past 30 years to prevent this. If that's the case, let's close shop, because nothing is going to change in whatever happens in the future, and let's go play golf. But there's another way of looking at this, which is that uh, you know, over the past 30 years, there's, there's, there's been certain issues, and a lot of it has been because we have outsourced, 
we have delegated, and we have taken things for granted for far too long. And that's what I wanted to point out. And I do think that as individuals, uh, as, and as a community, it's important for us to engage in this. Uh, that's, I'll, I'll stop there. Can I? Yes, please. Yes. Um, my question is for Sehan. Um, and I'm going to shift the conversation a little bit to the book and to Sehan, your research about denialism, specifically about the EU process, Turkey, Turkey's candidacy, that time period. Um, and it's kind of connected to the question of which agents do we credit in terms of like uh, bringing the question of the Armenian genocide, uh, keeping it on the agenda of at least some people. So I think what I'm asking in its core is like, why do you think the European Union people, public, had that emphasis at the time that for Turkey to be part of the union, it had to remember its past the right way? And this is a question that kind of always is in the back of my mind because there is, how to put it at this point, there's Orientalism there, right? There is double standard there. None of, like so many of these people who were accused, this is from the Turkish denialist book, so I have difficulty articulating it, but we need to negotiate that, right? Like France, I mean, they have their own colonial past and big, big, big mistakes that they haven't mm -hmm. dealt with the right way apology, reparations, and all that. So like, how, how do you as a scholar negotiate this, especially someone in Europe mm -hmm. doing this guy? Yeah, that's yeah. it. The, the wrongs of the past and the, the, the imbalance of being able to accuse others of yeah. particular wrongs. Thank you so much for this question, Lana. Because um, this is really a very critical issue because it has, it has two faces. On the one hand, um, one has to uh, acknowledge, so to say, that the dynamic that it, um, that it uh, brought into the Turkish discussion, but the other side, and that what, where, 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 um, what makes me think very critical about this uh, happening, or the, the, the fact that the Europe was discussing about this is, the question of identity in Europe is, has always been very important. So the European Union was always discussing what, what are we, who are we, blah, blah, blah. So, but at no point in the whole EU process, uh, the political process, um, it was so controversially debated. And that was, at the end, um, it was about, does Turkey belong to the European Union? Is Turkey European enough? And um, this just showed how much Turkey was perceived as Europe's other. So, um, you know, you have uh, in, in the media, Turkey was number one um, topic, the EU entry um, in, in the 2002 until uh, five. Um, and you have always this um, question whether, uh, or not the question, but um, things like that the uh, Turkey's entry would destroy the EU, that would be an um, end for the EU project, uh, or European project, or it's a harakiri. These are very um, esteemed people and um, discourse uh, participants uh, uh, who, who say that. Um, people like um, Giscard d'Estaing or um, very famous and intellectual, uh, intellect, uh, highly uh, esteemed intellectuals um, in Germany. So um, the point there was, uh, and the, 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 the uh, um, that the Armenian genocide was, was that the Turkey was called to face its past by European powers, or, or not powers, it's the, the wrong word here, but by European member states, it was for them an argument that Turkey was not European enough, you know what I mean? It was an argument that Turkey had to adopt, so to say, to um, European, the European way of, of thinking about the past um, as to 
qualify culturally. And here comes your point. Besides the Holocaust, there are so many other instances of, of mass crimes and state-sponsored mass crimes that have not been faced at all um, that this was a double standard against Turkey, of course. So my, uh, my point is, on the one hand, we had, had this um, positive effect, so to say, to give an impetus and a dynamic, but at the same time, and I think that was um, the key here was the Armenian um, genocide was used as to keep Turkey out of Europe and not to um, pull it, pull it in, and uh, to have um, welcome it in the uh, civilized nations of of, of Europeans that um, face their past better than Turkey. Does that? Yeah. What was, I just want to uh, interpolate uh, one of the questions from from Zoom here, and then I will uh, give you the mic, Joe. Um, question is, uh, the, rem the remark and question are, you've mentioned a lot about coalition building and I was wondering, the person writes, how can we, especially younger Armenians, encourage other Armenians to see the benefit and importance of coalition building? And I would add, are there lessons that can be learned from the experience of Armenians in the uh, immediate aftermath of, of the genocide that can be useful uh, to this current uh, moment in terms of coalition building as well. Oh, great question. Thank you. Uh, lessons that can be learned. Uh, one would be uh, the less, uh, you know, again, these are lessons that, you know, 100 years ago were learned the hard way, but I would say. Uh, The, the ways in which ultimately uh, communities came together to rebuild is, is I think, uh, is critical. And uh, these, this is not just limited to 100 years ago, uh, but also our, uh, you know, the recent past uh, where uh, on, on several instances, beginning with Iraq, uh, with, with Baku, and, and, and the exodus of Armenians from, uh, uh, from, from Baku, the forced uh, displacements of Armenians from Baku. Uh, I mentioned Iraq, I mentioned Syria, etc. cetera, uh, how we have tackled this as a community. Overwhelmingly, there is this uh, tremendous sense of solidarity and support, but ultimately, uh, we tend to just, uh, you know, life goes on, go into this kind of, uh, uh, you know, attitude that, uh, you know, this is, this is the, nor nor the norm today. And uh, some of these issues have not been fully addressed. And ultimately, uh, this leads to situations where, for example, in the case of Iraqi Armenians or others, uh, that kind of initial support and outpouring that was present in the beginning uh, is uh, wasted, both at the level of the state, something that didn't exist more than 100 years ago, but also at the level of the solidarity from within the community that sort of eventually fades away as other fires and other more emergencies are created. So perhaps one lesson would be for us to be mindful of, one, the successes of, of rebuilding that uh, we we saw in, in the past more than 100 years ago, the solidarities in the most darkest corners of the Ottoman Empire during the Armenian Genocide, uh, about which I have I've happened to have written a book. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, also learning from our failures in a sense that uh, the way in which we failed, you know, I don't think uh, we need to uh, mince our words here, with uh, uh, seriously tackling the challenges of the refugee crises with the first uh, Nagorno-Karabakh war, with uh, other wars and conflicts in the Middle East, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so because we said that the priority right now is supporting uh, those who are uh, affected by this calamity directly in Artsakh and those who are ending up in Armenia, I think I would emphasize this part. Let's do this right. Let's not do this in a way that is 
uh, more about showing off than anything else, you know, uh, about posting pictures about, you know, uh, you know uh, charity and blankets and envelopes and things like that, and, and do it effectively and do it consistently over, I, I realize that this is something that needs to happen over the long haul. If we want uh, uh, Armenians from Artsakh to uh, create, set new roots in their homeland, right? And, uh, and engage in it with it in a different way. Another important note here is that in many of these experiences of displacement, there was also the othering that, uh, you know, Sehan used the word earlier, that was very much present. Baku Armenians experienced it in Yerevan. Their kids experienced it in Yerevan. Uh, many others experienced it, uh, you know, have experienced it since. And I do think that if there is uh, one thing we can realize right now, no matter what, as Armenians, no matter what part of the world we are, is that uh, in, in this moment of, of, of grief and, and pain, it, it almost is this, has this equalizing factor, and it shows how we are all connected. I was uh, sort of, I'm not sure the joking is the right word, earlier with Mark saying that, we always say we should be united, united, and I don't really believe that being united is a thing for any group. But, you know, we, we, are, we seem to be sort of united in our grief, right? And I, and I do hope that that grief is also channeled in a way that we are united in a way, uh, in our approach to those who are affected by this the most. Uh, away from the uh, demonstrative actions and more towards uh, actually creating a sustainable life for them wherever they decide to live. Uh, moving forward. Um, I was wondering, how does genocide recognition or the lack of recognition uh, affect Armenian security or the lack of security? Do you want to say something? I'm happy to respond. I'm go ahead, go ahead. Uh, so do you mean Armenians in general? Everywhere? Or do you mean Armenia as a state? Well, Armenians in, let's say, uh, Armenia and Karabakh in the Middle East. Um, I think uh, Armenians in the diaspora don't have a problem mm -hmm. generally with security. Hmm. Well, this is a very tricky question. I um, can't. Should I say yeah, something? Go, yeah, go ahead. By, uh, because I, I mean, have a quick one, yeah. one thing I'm thinking is that, uh, and I would, I would actually emphasize this, that, you know, in many ways, th let me put it this way. A Turkey that had, had confronted uh, the Armenian genocide would not just sort of focusing on one little bit. The Turkey that had confronted the Armenian genocide, acknowledged the Armenian genocide and its responsibility in it, would not have behaved the way it did in this specific instance during the Second Artsakh War a few years ago and in the recent weeks and days. Just, just this one specific case. Uh, of course, this can be said about uh, much of the discourse and actions of the state of Turkey over the past uh, decades, right? So, so denial in many ways, and that, this is actually what I was thinking about when uh, Henry Terrio earlier said something like, uh, he, you know, he said, I was focusing on denial and, and didn't rela realize until, you know, 2019 that Artsakh, when, you know, was, was the thing. And I would say, you know what? Uh, and we've had this conversation with Mark as well. I would say that, in fact, these are intimately connected issues in a sense that uh, the denial of the Armenian genocide by Turkey created uh, the very environment in which the, the Turkish government today is on, in lockstep with Azerbaijan in policies 
that would have given any country that has committed genocide against a particular group pause when they're pretty much reenacting the very same thing. I'm not even saying here that, you know, say Germany would uh, or has behaved the same way against in its policies against all groups and all countries since World War II. But I would say that imagine Germany, right, uh, even engaging in anything remotely resembling what Turkey did today uh, and has done with just specific in the specific case of Artsakh. And that gives you a sense of the kind of uh, impact denial has. Uh, I, I just can't see any other way of looking at this. So it absolutely does have uh, serious implications. By the way, Taner Akcham has written about the, the flip side, about how Turkey uses denial in, as part of its own national security uh, uh, sort of perspective. And, and, th and that's, that's a conversation in its own right. Um, one more question uh, from, from online and, and then uh, perhaps you'll either have a final word or we'll wrap up and I should mention also, I must mention that the book is <laughs> available uh, for sale tonight and, and uh, people would love to, to, uh, to purchase it should do so uh, online as well. The question is, is there a grave risk of the long shadow of genocide extending even beyond Karabakh? And, and if I may once again add to the question, when, when does the shadow of genocide lift? Does the shadow of genocide lift? Is there a point when you can say the shadow of genocide has lifted? Sorry to end with an unanswerable question. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is a, a difficult question to answer. And I also don't want to answer in a way that uh, I don't like ending on a, on a sad note. Uh, is, is there an existential threat on Armenia proper? Uh, even though I don't want to end on a sad note, I think uh, I would be in denial if I said no. Uh, but at the same time, is it, uh, is it inevitable? Uh, it's, it's not. Uh, and I am not one who says that Armenia is, uh, uh, is, in, in, is in, in a kind of, uh, you know, is in this helpless situation where, where, where nothing can, can be done. So that's, uh, so, so that's uh, the, the first part uh, of the question. But to, uh, to say something more generally about the shadow of genocide, I don't think the shadow of genocide is something, because what is this sh shadow? Let's, let's, let's go there, right? It is, it is essentially the area where uh, the sun does not hit, let's say, or the light doesn't hit. And, and so yes, I think in certain ways uh, the shadow can be uh, contained, reduced with with uh, with with greater knowledge, with with greater awareness, with greater uh, justice. I don't know if it can uh, be altogether uh, erased. Uh, it also will be removed. Uh, you know, will uh, you know, is is becomes less of a presence. One hopes as generations pass, but we also see that that is not the case. In fact, the shadow of the Armenian genocide has unfortunately become longer in recent uh, weeks. And, uh, and that's another thing to acknowledge, right? As a community, when we are witnessing this, uh, the, the, the trigger effect of the horrors in Artsakh, right, are impacting and re-traumatizing com the community over and over again. And this is a way in which the shadow is extended, inevitably. And this is a way in which, again, our perceptions and our ways in which we think about threats, etc., is going to be impacted moving forward. Uh, uh, but ultimately, again, I uh, perhaps, as, as my final word, I would say that as someone who uh, worked on, wrote a book about Armenians and the way in which they organized 
to help save their fellow Armenians in the darkest corners of the Armenian genocide during World War I. And as someone who has studied and worked on and learned and been a student of the early years in the aftermath of the Armenian genocide, uh, that generation uh, was able to survive, revive, uh, rebuild a state that we have inherited and rebuild communities. And if, it, if they could do it back then, I believe we can do it now. Okay. Then thank you very much. All right. Thank you.